Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. All right, uh, those of you that are visiting with us, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you being here today. What we do here at Wash by the Word is we go through a book in the Bible verse by verse. We just take our time and go through it verse by verse. We're in 1 John chapter 5 today. We're going to be covering verses 6, Lord willing, 6 through 13. We're going to see a couple of key things here. The first thing we're going to see is that uh, Jesus is God. We're going to see that John hits that real hard today in this portion of scripture that we're in. So we're going to be seeing that Jesus is God, and we're also going to see that those who believe in Jesus Christ have eternal life. Those are the two key components here of this section of 1 John. This is the end of the body of 1 John here. After this, starting in verse 14 all the way to 21, it sort of, he sort of wraps up the letter. So this is sort of the summary section of 1 John here. It's an interesting section. It's one of the more difficult verses. Uh, one person said this is the most perplexing passage in the entire letter of 1 John. In fact, it's one of the most perplexing passages in all of the New Testament. So we're going to be looking at a perplexing section of the Scripture here, but it'll be fun. God's Word is God's Word, so we're just going to have fun with it. Here as we look at this, we want to remember something really important. If you turn in your Bibles just to 1 John chapter 1 at the very beginning, remember this is the wrap-up. Remember how he started. And it's so important we remember this because he's writing, remember John is writing at a time when something known as Gnosticism is rampant throughout the church now. It's starting to really come in. And he's based out of Ephesus at this time. And there in Ephesus, there's a, a Gnostic leader named Serinthus. And Serinthus is a crazy guy. We've talked about him before. He's a, labeled a heretic already. And John is hitting him really hard in this letter because of the doctrine of Serinthus. Serinthus had come on the scene and had taught a number of people and lured some of the Christian followers of Jesus into his little her, heretic camp by teaching that matter is evil, spirit is good. And because matter is evil, you need to calm yourself with your sin. Okay, so you like to sin. Big deal. You're, you're, it's just your body. It's evil. It doesn't count. As long as your spirit is clean. Oh man, isn't that a nice license to sin? There's a ticket to hell. Gnosticism. John hits that hard in 1 John. And what we're going to see is Serenthus said, well, you see, Jesus was a man, just a man. But the Spirit of Christ came upon him at his baptism. We saw that. This is my son. The Spirit came upon him like a dove. Prior to that, he was just Jesus, according to Serenthus. And the Spirit of Christ came upon him at baptism, stayed on him until just before he died on the cross. When Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Serinthus taught it was at that time the Spirit of Christ left him, and just the man Jesus died. Because God could never die on a cross. He's God. Matter is evil. Spirit is good. Calm yourself. Sin away. Don't worry about it. Paul addressed that. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember just prior, he said, the more you sin, the more God gives grace to forgive. Well, I'm going to really show you how graceful God is. I'll even sin more. No, no, no. He said, don't. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And we'll be getting in Romans 6 there later on today. So that's where we're at. Now, this whole thing of matter is evil, that Jesus was just a man, John hits full force in this letter. That's what this letter is about. No. We talked about the theanthropic nature of Jesus, fully God, fully man. And remember in 1 John chapter 1, it said this, 
Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, there was a branch of Gnosticism called de uh, deism or seemism, docetism or seemism. And in it it said, Jesus wasn't a real man, he just seemed to be a man. He was a spirit looking like a man. Written, or this came about 60 years after his ascension. And John says, no, no, we heard him, we've seen him with our eyes, we've looked upon him, we touched him concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which is with the Father was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. So that's how it starts off. Now at the end of this letter, in verse 6, he again addresses this very same thing. He makes it very clear that the Jesus of Christianity is not the Gnostic Jesus. He's not a spiritual manifestation. He's not just a man who the Spirit of Christ came upon and left. No, he's Jesus, fully God and fully man. And that's what he's going to address very directly here in verses 6 through 13 of chapter 5. Jesus is God. And what he's going to show us is that there are three witnesses that witness to us that Jesus is God. Three witnesses that declare the perfect Messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. It starts off in verse 6. This is he. Well, let's go to verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he, speaking of Jesus, who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ. Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Now we read that and you just go, what? What is this? And in fact, that question has been asked for like 1,800 years. And there's all kinds of interpretations. I'm just going to throw them out there for you a little bit. Those of you that have been in church history, you're going to recognize all these names. These are the heavy hitters of the history of the church with different understandings of this verse. If you're taking church history tomorrow night, put on your seatbelts. You're in for an awesome ride. You're going to absolutely love church history. It's crazy what you're about to be exposed to. It's fantastic. But as we look at this, it says, He who came by water and blood... Some believe that water speaks, and they've taught that it speaks of our own baptism. Jesus, who came by water, when you were baptized, the Lord came upon you into you. That was a teaching in parts of the history of the church. And when it says blood, it's talking about receiving communion. So he says, you get to receive Jesus when you're baptized and when you take communion. That has been a teaching of the early church. Martin Luther taught that. If you read Martha Luther's commentary on this passage, that's what he teaches. Those of you that are strong followers of John Calvin, Calvin taught this. So this is a, a Calvinistic and a Lutheran approach. Most of you know I have a Lutheran background. But when I was Lutheran, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't really study a whole lot. But I, since I've come to Christ and since I got into church history, I read Luther like it's popcorn at a movie. I love reading Luther. And this was his position. There's another position Augustine took. He said, no, 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 no. When it says here, Jesus came by water and blood, remember what John had written in his gospel. Remember in John, it was a chapter 19, verse 35 there, Jesus died on the cross and a soldier came by there to, to break his legs, like they did with everybody who's being crucified, to, to expedite their death. And they came to Jesus, they were shocked, he was dead already. But to make sure, he took a spear, put it in his side, and would have thrust it up into his heart to make certain he was dead. And then John records that out of that wound flew, or flowed blood and water. I was listening to Pastor Chuck just recently on that passage in John 19. And uh, he had an interesting comment on that. I've taught it before, heard it before, and it's just one of the things you kind of put away. And then hearing it again, it just brought it back to my mind. I just kind of smiled, you know. 
You can't listen. You know, I was listening to him. But um, he talked about the pericardial sac around the heart and the fluid around there that appears as water. Is that true? My, my Mr. David PA guy? Okay. And as he put the spear up into the heart and water and blood came out, it says that when a heart is broken, when a heart is damaged, when it is ruptured, the blood and the pericardial fluid around the heart will mix and it'll look like a blood water serum. Which is interesting there in John because we could literally say that Jesus died with a broken heart, which is kind of an interesting way of looking at that metaphorically. And Augustine points to that. But, of course, the issue with that, it says, this is he who came by water and blood, and the question is, how does that fit in? It's, it's interesting, but others believe that, no, 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 the water speaks of Jesus' birth. When the water breaks and the baby is born and the blood speaks of his death, showing that the Gnostic view of a spirit being is completely tossed out. The earliest recording understanding of this passage is by a guy that you in church history all know, Tertullian, the man who developed the doctrine of the Trinity, the man who later sided with Montanus and was labeled a heretic by the church of the day. Those of you that have ever been confronted with a knock on your door in the Watchtower Society. And if you talk to the one who does most of the talking, he will try and challenge your faith. One of the things that they will try to help you deny is the Trinity. And one of the things that Jehovah Witnesses will do if you choose to study with them, which basically means you're dumber than a stick. <laughs> but if you choose to do that, then they will try to encourage you to understand that Tertullian, the Christian scholar who developed the doctrine or used the word Trinity for the first time, was later labeled a heretic. And they will say that you realize that the doctrine of the Trinity was formed by a man who was considered a heretic of the church. That's a true statement. He was considered a heretic later in his life. The reason he was considered a heretic later in his life is he left the typical, what we'd call evangelical church because of all the sexual immorality that was going on in the church. And he said, you guys are all crazy. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're sitting there sleeping with whoever moves and calling yourself a Christian. I'm out of here. And he went to Montanus, who had a very strange doctrine saying whatever comes out of my mouth supersedes whatever the apostles taught. But he looked at Montanus and he says, but they're moral. They're living the Christian life. I'm going to follow that. And the church says, yeah, we got hypocrites. We sure do. But that does not okay false doctrine. So they labeled him a heretic. And he died a follower of Montanus. So the man who developed the Trinity, used the word for the first time, the man who we are going to take and kind of adhere to his interpretation of this passage, later became a heretic. I find that interesting because that's a good reminder for all of us. You might be on fire for Jesus when you're, how old are you, Tito, 22? When you're 22, stay on fire. Because you can hit 62 and be completely whacked out and resting on 40 years of following Jesus and it's not going to work. So stay on fire every day. Stay on fire every day. Don't ever retire from following Jesus, my friend. <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there with Jesus. Well, his interpretation of this verse, Tertullian, probably the best explanation of this verse that I came across, even though there are good truths from all these other ones that are they're there. Luther's understanding, yeah, that's a true statement. Augustine's, that's awesome. This appears to be the best from the text 
It's the oldest and usually it's the most accepted. And that is, he says, John probably means that the water here refers to his baptism, to the baptism of Jesus, and the blood to his crucifixion. In light of, he is writing to the Gnostics who said at his baptizing the Spirit of Christ came upon him and just before the cross the Spirit of Christ left him and John is going against that again like he did at the beginning of his letter. Seems to make an awful lot of sense. We can agree to disagree but it seems to be the one that today most people are adhering to. It seems to be the most solid of them. Now, as we look at this, this is he who came by water and blood. Now, he came by water and blood. Not by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness. So we look at these three witnesses. The water witnesses of who Jesus is. The blood witnesses of who Jesus is. And now we see the spirit witnesses of who Jesus is. He came by water and blood. When he was baptized, Jesus came not to be baptized by John as a sinner. We remember the baptism of Jesus. John was baptizing a baptism unto repentance, remember? And when Jesus came, John says... I should be baptized by you, hello. Jesus did not come to be baptized as a sinner, as a baptism unto repentance. The word baptizo in the Greek has two meanings. It means to immerse and to identify. And it appears that Jesus, as he comes to the river, the Jordan River, to be baptized, he did not come to be immersed as a sinner being baptized unto repentance. He came to identify with a world of sinners. And that becomes the beginning of his public ministry. Remember, as he comes up out of the water, identifying with the world of sinners. We hear the voice, remember, in Matthew chapter 3. Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This perfect man, fully man, fully God, now publicly identifying with a sinful world, and as he comes up out of the water, having identified, we hear the voice of God saying, I'm pleased with my son right there. And his ministry starts. Then it says also with the blood. Jesus came, the baptism, he said, I'm one of you. I'm identifying with a lost world. On the cross, he didn't die because he had to. Jesus says, nobody takes my life, I lay it down. We don't get a chance to lay down our life. I can't just say, you know, I'm done. Spirit, go, I'm done. See you, bye. Doesn't work that way. It worked that way for Jesus. No one killed Jesus. Jesus gave his life. He said, it is finished, I'm done. And on the cross here, as he laid down his life, once again to identify with sinful humanity, and to pay the price of my sin, your sin, the sins of the world, he had identified with us, and now he died for our sins. He died for us. He, he identified with us so he could stand in our place as a sinner, and then he offered his blood as that perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future. Do you realize that? Jesus took the punishment that should have been mine. Jesus took the wrath of God that should have been mine. He took the punishment that should have been yours. He took the wrath of God that should have been yours. He did that because he loved you. He loves you. Simple as that. The sin you're thinking about right now, committing tomorrow, God already knows if you're going to do it or not. He is so far out of time, He knows exactly everything you're thinking about doing, doing, and have done, going to do, and He died for all of it. He said, now, just place your faith in Me. 
And if we can grasp that, guys, if we can grasp the love of God, that is what will stop us from a life of a continual sin. But not until we get to know Jesus. Otherwise, it's just a get-out-of-jail-free card. But if we know him and we love him, that stops it. The continual sin stops. The Bible's very clear on that. He who continues, and they list, remember, in 1 Corinthians 6, a, a series of sins. Those who continually practice those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they're not in the kingdom of God. You will not continually practice sin if you're in the kingdom of God. You will feel guilty and you will turn. It's one of the evidences of truly being saved. That's how you will know. One of the witnesses. So, the water, the blood. It says, he who came by water and blood. Remember that. The, the Gnostics taught that, no, the Spirit of Christ came on him at baptism, left before the cross. He says, no, 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 no. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. In John 15, he writes, and again in John 16, he writes, when the Spirit of God will come, when I send you my Spirit, Jesus says, he will testify of me. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine, and he'll declare it to you. The Spirit is truth, and he'll declare it to you. The consistent message of the Holy Spirit over and over and over again is, here's Jesus. Those of you that are older, we're going way back now. How many know who Jimmy Fallon is? How many know who Jay Leno is before Jimmy Fallon? How many ever watched the guy before Jay Leno, Johnny Carson? The old ones, the young ones go, who now? But that's... How many know who Ed McMahon is? How many ever heard Ed McMahon say, here's Johnny? <laughs> Ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here's Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He points to Jesus. He points to Jesus. He points to Jesus. He points to Jesus. He never points to himself. He points to Jesus. A true Spirit-filled church is not about the gifts of the Spirit. A true Spirit-filled church is all about Jesus. Jesus is who the Holy Spirit points to. The Holy Spirit does nothing but say, here's Jesus, here's Jesus, here's Jesus. He's a witness of Jesus. When we point to the gifts of the Spirit, that typically is a pride-filled church because the gifts of the Spirit manifest themselves through us. Look at my gift. My gift's greater than your... Wrong focus. The focus is not on the gifts, it's on Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit so we can be witnesses of Jesus. It's Jesus. That's it. That's it. I want to encourage you to get last Sunday night's teaching on Acts chapter 4. There wasn't a title on there, but if there would have been, it would have been basically, here's Jesus. That's what it's about. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. It's just Jesus. That's what it's at. I find it interesting. A priest in the Old Testament had three things, three components that would be used when they ordained that priest. They would offer a sacrifice and the blood would be sprinkled. They would take water, sprinkle and wash and cleanse him. And they would take oil and poured over him. Oil and scripture type of the Holy Spirit. The three witnesses of a high priest. Water, the blood, and the Spirit. Interesting we see it here. Interesting. These three bear witness, it says. So he says, he who came, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness. And now we're going to get into something that I'm really uncomfortable, but I've got to, I've got to, I've got to share it. This is the hardest part about 1 John. If you write in your Bibles, if you have a New King James Bible, if you have uh, other translations, this won't be an issue. But if you have a New King James, an Old King James Bible, if you have the Revised Standard Bible or any Bibles that have come from that, it's going to say in verse 7, for there are three that bear witness, and then it's going to say in heaven. 
And I would encourage you, if you write in your Bible, just put a little bracket like, a, like one of these things, you know. Put that in front of the in. And then it says, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. And after earth there, I would put the other end of the bracket. So you just have, be, between the ends of the bracket, in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. Just put that in a bracket, that's all. Don't write anything about it, just put it in a bracket so when you're reading through it down the road, oh yeah, that's that bracket we saw. Because it's interesting, inside your bracket is not included in most Bibles. What's really interesting, it's not in any Greek manuscript prior to 1200. It's in none of the main manuscripts, Greek manuscripts that the Bibles are based on, the 3rd and 4th century manuscripts. It's none of them. None of the early church fathers quote it. Jerome didn't include it in the Vulgate that he did the translation, remember, from Hebrew and Greek into Latin there in Bethlehem. He didn't, it wasn't there. The first person to quote this as a sidelight was a Spanish dude. In 385 A.D., he was a heretic. Yep, there were some heretics in Spain, too. <laughs> His name was Priscillian. His name was Priscillian. He was a crazy guy. He's the first one to quote it. Not as scripture, just to quote that phrase. Then, over time, it started to creep into the Latin text. Not the Greek manuscripts, but the Latin texts. And started showing up in there. By the time we get to the time of Luther in 1516, those of you that are church history nuts, you might want to read a book called Bondage of the Will. It's Martin Luther and Erasmus going back and forth, two very brilliant minds going back and forth on the free will of man and all. It's an interesting, interesting book if you just want some fun reading, Bondage of the Will. But at any rate, Erasmus is a brilliant Dutch scholar, and he's the first one to come up with a Greek New Testament, way in the 1500s. Brilliant scholar. He studied all the manuscripts. Remember, they, this had shown up in some of the manuscripts in the 1300s now. But he looked at the manuscripts, only in Latin text, but he looked at the manuscripts, the Greek, and he says, it's not in there, I'm not putting it in there. Oh, man. Those that looked at the Latin Vulgate is their source of truth came down on him big time. Why did you not put this passage with your brackets are around? Why is that not in the Bible? What are you doing? What is wrong with you? And he says, all you got to do is show me one Greek manuscript with that in it I'll include it. And they came up with a Greek manuscript from the 1400s that was poorly done and they said, here it is. And he wrestled with it and wrestled with it. And in 1522, he says, against my better judgment, I will be a man of my word. I never should have said that. I said it. I'm putting it in there. So all of a sudden, Erasmus's later Bible had it in there. 1522. Then, 1611, and just prior, the king of England says, I want a Bible in English. So they gathered all these people together to put a translation from the Greek manuscript into English. They grabbed a 1522 Erasmus Greek Bible, backed it up with different manuscripts, came to this verse, and they included it in the King of England's Bible, known as King James Bible. So it's in the King James Bible. It's in the New King James Bible. So here we are. I'm not going to tell you it shouldn't be there. I'm just saying put brackets around it. What's in those brackets are awesome. I mean, it's good stuff. It says there's three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. There's a major reference to the Trinity. Oh, my goodness. There it is. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. It is the most distinct verse in all the Scripture on the Trinity. There it is. If you study with the Watchtower Society people, they will point that out to you. And if you can't believe that, then how can you believe anything else? Well, we have a better translation for you. You've got to do the New World Translation. That's 
So it's important to understand the background, how it came about, how it didn't come about. So we're going to go and just go around the brackets. It's a true statement. There's three in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. They're one. Yes, they are. There's the Trinity, three in one. But there are three that bear witness on earth. So let's go back in verse 6 at the end. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, and this is what the early manuscripts have. After witness there, it goes all the way down to the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at it like that. And we're going to look at these three that bear witness because it's kind of encouraging for us as believers today. The three that bear witness. I want us to turn in our Bibles, and I'd like everybody to turn here. We don't leave the text too much on Sunday mornings, but we're going to today. If we can go to Romans chapter 8. Romans is about, oh, eight or nine, ten, maybe twelve books before 1 John. Maybe about a hundred pages or so. But we're going to go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to go to verse 12. It says, Therefore, speaking of the Spirit that dwells in us, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will be separated. Remember we talked about the word death, thanatos, it means to be separated. Have you noticed how continual sin separates you from the presence of God? Have you noticed how continual sin separates you from the fellowship with God's people? Have you noticed how continual sin separates you from, from just loving Jesus like you know you used to? He says, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. Here it is. The Spirit himself bears witness, witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's the key. The Spirit himself, not itself, himself. The Spirit himself bears witness that we are children of God. The enemy can come in our minds, can come in my mind and point out my failures, my sin, my weaknesses. He does that, you know. He's the accuser of the brethren to the Lord and to our own minds. But the Spirit in us says, no, I'm a child of God. Amen. There's something in there that when we come to Christ and His Spirit comes in us, it bears witness. I'm not perfect. I'm not what I should be all the time. But I'm a child of God and I'm on my way to glory. And I'm going to do everything I can to live up to the family name. I want to be a Christian. A follower of God. Not walking in my flesh. I'm a Christian. Perfect? No. But I'm going to keep walking with Jesus. I'm not going to allow sin to separate me from my Savior. I'm not going to allow the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the world, to take me away from the Lord. No way. The problem is, I can't do that apart from Christ. But the Spirit in me bears witness. I might not feel like a child of God, but then there's the Spirit of God saying, You're mine. You're mine. Bears witness. The water of the three, the water. The baptism of Jesus. Remember, John saw the Spirit descending on Jesus. It was at that baptism he realized, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The early church used the baptism, the Christian baptism, as a way of witness to the Messiahship of Jesus, to the power of Jesus, to the fact that Jesus is alive. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, remember, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized were baptized into his death? And then we are raised again to walk in newness of life? Baptism for the early church became a, a picture, a symbol, a point in time. 
time for each believer, it was there that I publicly chose to identify with Jesus. Jesus identified with me in the Jordan. I'm identifying with Jesus in the water of baptism. And as I go under the water, I am identifying with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And as I come up out of the water, I'm identifying with his resurrection and his life, that he's alive. And now I'm going to walk in newness of life. Amen. Baptism. Baptism actually is a witness. It was in the early church. It is today. Baptism doesn't save us, but it's a point that I can use as a witness. No, I chose to follow Jesus right there. That's where I did it. It's a witness. When the enemy attacks, he challenges, I don't think you're really a Christian. Oh, I am. I'm a sinner, but I'm a saved sinner, and I'm repenting of my sin. And the enemy's got me. He's shaken me. But the spirit within me is a witness of who I am. My baptism is a point in my history where right there I publicly identified amongst other people. I was placed under the water and I was raised up out of the water by arms other than mine. Just as I will one day be raised, not by my power, but the power of God, I will come up and raise from the dead. Baptism. It's a beautiful picture. And it's an important element as a witness of who we are. And then the blood. It says there that this blood is a witness. Blood was precious to God in the sacrifices. Blood was life. Remember, uh, the life is in the blood. God told the children of Israel, don't eat the blood. Life is in the blood. In the sacrifices, it was the blood sacrifices for sin, for trespasses. Jesus and his blood was the perfect sacrifice. At the cross, his blood was poured out, the perfect sacrifice. Identifying with us, he offered his sin-free blood, so to speak, on our behalf. Beautiful thing, beautiful thing. We've been studying communion in our lit classes on Saturday mornings a little bit. Yesterday we looked at transubstantiation and consubstantiation and how that fits into communion, and, and then the, also the communion that is a remembrance aspect. We, we looked at the Roman Catholic Church's view of transubstantiation, looked at the Lutheran view of consubstantiation, we looked at the Zwinglian, Zwingli's view of in remembrance of me. We talked about the Conference of Marlborough a little bit between Luther and Zwingli and the 20, 28 points that they were, they were working out until they came to the point of communion and the break that took place because of that. And we talked about communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. The two ordinances, remember, that Jesus told us we should do. One was baptism, we can see why. The other was communion. Remember, he took the body and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. He took the bread and broke it. And said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup after supper, the cup of redemption. And said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of, the, drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. His death, something to remember. Remember, he did that at a remembrance meal, the Passover meal. Remembering the redemption of God's people from Egypt, a type of the world, and there he institutes a new covenant out of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, remember. A new covenant ratified in his blood in which the sins will not be covered, they will be taken away and remembered no more. And every time we take communion, we remember what the Lord has done, and we have an opportunity to draw into his presence, to confess our sins, to fall at his feet and say, oh, thank you, Lord. It becomes not only a remembrance, but almost a mystical union with Jesus, that special point of fellowship with him. The three things that bear witness, the spirit in us, the baptism, and remembering his death, the Lord's Supper. The three witnesses, interesting, interesting, interesting. They demonstrate the perfect messiahship of Jesus. The perfect sonship at his baptism. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the perfect saviorhood. The only one who could be savior of the world because of his sin-free life. The perfect blood and sacrifice. An interesting, interesting, interesting component. These three that bear witness. Now it says in verse 9, we're going to pick it up very quickly going out here. If we receive the witness of men, and we do, do we not? That's how our court system is based on. If you have an eyewitness, that's good. If you have two, three eyewitnesses, you're in toast. If you're guilty, you've got three people seeing you do it, and they're all agreeing, and you're in trouble. 
In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 19, 15, it says, don't ever take the witness of one person. But on the, on the basis of two or three witnesses, every fact should be established. And he says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God, the threefold witness of God, is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. There is the three that bear witness. Not one, not even two, three. A threefold witness of God about Jesus, that Jesus is God. Here it is. He says, and this is what he's testified of the Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. It doesn't say he who, be who, he who believes the Son of God, he who believes in the Son of God. There's a difference. That in is very important. I can believe someone. Gabriel, I'm going to believe you. I believe Gabriel. He told me that he was hanging out with a two-year-old this week. I believe him. All week. I believe him. I believe him. But I also believe in Gabriel. I don't really believe him. I believe in him. Gabriel told me back in January, I'm done. I believed in you. So I'm going to do it. Here we are, nine months later. Eight months later. Yeah. Sweet. He keeps track. I just keep believing in him. But to believe him is one thing, but to believe in him is a whole other thing. To believe Jesus, okay. But to believe in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, it's much more than just believing him. It is completely entrusting ourselves in him. It is completely believing who he is, what he says, a complete trust in in him. For Jesus to believe in Jesus, here's my life, I'm entrusting it into your hands, Jesus. I believe you. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The Spirit of God comes in. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony, the witness that God has given of his Son. God just gave us three witnesses that Jesus is God. I don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe that, then you're saying, God, you gave witness three times. Three eyewitness testimonies. Three witnesses, God, and I don't believe it. In other words, John says, if you don't believe Jesus is the promised Messiah, if you don't believe he is the Son of God, if you don't believe Jesus is God, he's just a good man, just a good teacher, then you are simply saying, according to the word of God, God, I'm calling you out. You're a liar. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Serinthus was basically doing that. In Ephesus, John and his disciples were going into a bathhouse in, in Ephesus. When you go to Ephesus today, they, they've discovered the bathhouse. Bath it's kind of a cool thing to walk in there because you see it and you realize this is the bathhouse of Ephesus, probably the one where this happened. But John walked in with his disciples and Serinthus was in there. He looked, he says, Ah! Serinthus, the son of Satan, is in here. Quick, everybody out! I don't want to be in the same building with him because God is going to judge him so bad. And the last thing I want to do is be in a building where Serinthus is in because it would be just like it that God would judge him. I'm in there. I die because Serinthus is an idiot. And he took off. I love that. I can guarantee you John would never study with the Jehovah Witness. He would say, I got to go. And nobody got time for this. Nobody. made him a liar. You've made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given us of his son. And this is the testimony, what is it? That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Eternal life. The word in the Greek for eternal life is an interesting, interesting word. Ionius or Ionius. It's more than just living forever. And I'm thankful for that. Could you imagine if it was just living a long time and that was it? I'm 62 now. When I was like 25, 27, living forever in my body back then sounded pretty good. I could run, I could jump, I could throw. It was just pretty good. I could live forever like this. Now I'm 62, living forever like this? That's not a good idea. <laughs> That's just not a good idea. I'm not as strong as I used to be. I don't even try to run. I, well, I did try. Connie came out to watch me about a year and a half. I'm going to try to run, babe. She was out there watching to make sure I didn't have a heart attack or something. And <laughs> man, it hurts to run. My knees are okay until you run. 
I was running on a road. That was probably the best idea, but it was like, <laughs> things were shaking. My shoulders, how do your shoulders hurt from running? That's crazy. It's just, it's just weird. Those of you that are getting up there, you know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like. You lay on one side, you got to roll to the other side. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And you got to prepare to roll over to the other side. You got to prepare. How many know what I'm talking about besides me? Look at, look at this. The old folks' hands going up. The young people, are, seriously, I got to worry about rolling over? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And you know the noise it makes when you get up. You put that foot on the floor, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, here we go. You know. And you'd think that'll never happen to you. Because I'm the same way, James. I was right there at that age. It never happened to me. This, my wife has a great phrase. Just keep waking up in the morning. And all of a sudden, the first time, it's like, what? I'm getting old? What? So just to have eternal life, if, if it's just living like this, eternal life, that's not good. It's much more than living like this. But the Ionius has an interesting interesting, interesting, significant meanings all over it. But one of the big ones is it's the life of God now. You have eternal life. You can experience the life that God has for you, the Zoe life. Life the way God intended it to be. You can experience it now. And you, the part that makes you you, will live forever. But not in this old body. This body's wearing out, man. You get yourself a glorified body with hair. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's coming. It's coming. But life, the way God intended it to be. A peace, the peace of God that passes all. You can have that now. True serenity. You don't have to go to 12 steps to get true serenity. One step to Jesus. You can have it. You can have it. The peace of God. The power of God. No more frustration. No more frustration. You can have the power of God in your life now. The power of God to say no. The power of God to do what's right. And not be frustrated day after day after day. Well, I guess this is the way God made me. Oh, stop. Stop. You can have holiness in your life now. Power over sin, defeat of sin in your life. We don't have to give in to sin and say, this is what it is. No, no, you can have the life of God now, eternal life. That's what that embraces. You can have it right now. You can have love, agape love in your life. You don't have to be bitter anymore. You don't have to hate anymore. You don't have to have snide remarks anymore. You can actually be an instrument of love. Think of that. But if you don't, if you do, oh, I've got hate and bitterness in my life, well then be honest with God. Be honest with Him about it. You know, don't be a hypocrite. Just be honest. How can we even think of snowing God? He knows what's in us. You know, don't go, bro, Lord, just help me to love that person so much more, the love that you have. Lord, I got some love for him, but Lord, I need to love him more. Help me. God's looking at you. <laughs> well, not, you're lying to me. Be honest. God, I hate him. He makes me sick. I can't stand him. And I know that's sin, God. Help me. Help me, God. Forgive me. Be honest. You can be honest with God. He knows already. Be honest. But you can have eternal life. Agape love. No more bitterness. No more hurt. Our oldest daughter shared something with me couple years ago, I kept it in my phone forever. It was so easy. She just said, you know, Dad, I found that hurt people hurt people. When we're hurt, we hurt. Don't have to live that way anymore. Just let it go. Just love. The life of God himself now. Life. Zoe love, life, no more separation, no more thanatos. The love of God, the presence of God, that's eternal life. Yes, it does last forever, but it's so much more than just living forever. As we saw, even living an extra 100 years would really stink if it's just like this. If I'm 162, I've got some serious issues going on. I'm not hearing you, I'm not seeing you. I'm just laying there. 
Don't worry, it's not going to happen. But could you imagine how rotten that would be? I'm 62. That gives me about seven and a half years left. And then I'm going to be dead. That's going to be awesome. I'm going to be with Jesus. The Bible says you get 70 years. 80 if you take care of yourself. So I figure 70. <laughs> I've gained four pounds since my accident. I had that accident and the doctor said, don't work out. It's hard not to stay a flat stomach if you can't exercise. And it's like, man, I can't exercise my back, my shoulders, my neck. So I can't, I just sit here and I just try not to eat too much and I still, I gained four pounds. But it's four pounds right here. It's really crazy. Yeah, it's disgusting is what it is. But I get to go back in the gym. I got released to the gym a month and a half ago. <laughs> I'll be there. Just give me some. I'm getting ready. I'm just getting ready. You understand? I'm just getting ready. Getting ready. I don't want to rush into that. It's a serious commitment. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. That's where we get it. It's not in a church. It's not in a wife. It's not in a husband. It's not in a child. It's not in a parent. It's not in a movement. It's in his son. Amen. It has nothing to do with washed by the word. It has nothing to do with those that are from a Catholic background to the Catholic church. Those that are Lutheran background. It has nothing to do with the Lutheran church. It has nothing to do with the Baptist church, Assembly of God church, the Evangelical church. Any, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. True followers of Jesus get eternal life. Believers have eternal life. Sweet. The Son has life. Verse 12. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. John wrote that earlier in his Gospel, John 3.36, the very same words, but he put on the end of it, and the wrath of God abides on him. Whoa! He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life, and the wrath of God lives on him. Ain't nobody got time for the wrath of God living on you. Jesus took the wrath of God. We place our faith in Jesus. We have the Son of God, and now His wrath is not on us. We try and trust in a church. We try and trust, trust in a movement. Or worse yet, we try and trust even in ourselves. Well, I'm pretty good. No, you're not. You're a stinking sinner. We all are. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. Nope, not one. Okay, now we know you're a sinner. If you're breathing, you're a sinner. And our sin brings the wrath of God, separates us from God, and brings the wrath of God on us, abides on us. Jesus came, went on the cross, took the wrath of God that belonged on me and on you, took it on himself. And if we place our faith in Jesus, we become part of the family of God. It says in John chapter tw uh, 1, verse 12, as many as received Jesus, to them they gave, he gave the right to become a child of God. That's pretty sweet right there. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The last verse. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. If you do not believe in the name of Jesus Christ today, this isn't for you. In fact, none of the Bible's for you. This is a love letter written to God's kids. So if you're just a good churchgoer, this isn't for you. If you're an atheist, this isn't for you. What are you doing here anyway? You're an atheist, but I'm glad you're here. I'm going to try and convince you otherwise. That's kind of, you're kind of crazy. You're not even a good atheist, are you? <laughs> you're a sinning atheist, I guess. You're going against your own beliefs. That's crazy. But at any rate, he says, I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of, of, Son of God. Why? That you may know, epinosis, that you may know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you may know that you have this eternal life. If you believe in Jesus, if you have truly placed your faith in Christ, for real, not talking American Jesus, now I'm not talking coming up and raising your hand, saying a prayer and going home and living like the devil, no. But if you truly made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, for real, he says, I wrote these things that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. What is the name of the Son of God? Jesus. There it is. That's what this is about. It's all about Jesus. And that's how he kind of ends 1 John. Next week we'll finish 1 John. Just kind of the wrap up. He's going to talk about the assurance we have when we ask God anything. 
answered prayer. That's good stuff right there. So we'll finish up 1 John next week. <sighs> 1 John. We spent so many weeks in agape love, just loving each other. Now we see at the very end, he wraps it up, and he says, Jesus is the Son of God, guys. And he just wants to give those who truly believe that the assurance that no matter what attacks come against you from the enemy, from other people, or even from yourself, there are three witnesses that say, no, Jesus is God. And now the Word of God tells us if you believe in Jesus Christ for real, you have eternal life right now. It's not something you get. You have it now. How cool is that? So we just love Jesus, man. Just loving the Lord. We want to be a witness. We didn't cover the five-fold witness. There's actually six-fold witness in the Gospel of John. Where he gives in John 5, you might look it up if you like to study, but he's got all these things that are, John the Baptist was a witness to him, the Word of God was a witness to him, the works were a witness to Jesus, the Spirit's a witness to Jesus, the Father's a witness to Jesus. And then he says, those of you who follow me, you are a witness to me too. So if you follow Jesus, we're to be a witness. And that's what Jesus told us, did he not, in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're to be a witness. We have all these witnesses telling us Jesus is God. Now we are that light. Go out and tell people Jesus is God. Amen. May you have an awesome week this week.